So good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome to this uh, webinar from uh, Albany Law School Online Graduate Programs team. Uh, my name is Will Trevor. I am the Assistant Dean and Director of Online Programs here at uh, Albany Law School. You're very welcome to our webinar, Labour Relations, and it's, uh, Zachary Jones of United Airlines is going to be discussing lessons from a lifetime on the front line as a Labour negotiator. Next slide, please. So just a few words of housekeeping before we get started. Um, closed captioning uh, is going to be uh, available um, and uh, you'll see it down there uh, on the screen. There, there is the possibility for you to change the, the size of it. If you just uh, uh, hit the uh, transcript button, you can uh, change the slide, make it larger, make it smaller. Uh, there will also be a copy of the recording that will be made available afterwards to, to everybody. Uh, and please can I encourage you to post questions. Along the bottom, you'll see a, a QA um, um, tab. Uh, into there, you can post uh, your questions for Zachary as we move forward. Uh, we will also be posting uh, periodically. My colleague Nicole will post a link to our uh, survey, uh, and there'll also be a survey link at, uh, at the end. Please do give us the feedback. Uh, it helps us to ensure that we're able to offer you uh, good quality programmes and, and uh, wonderful speakers like Zachary uh, moving forward. Next slide, please. So this um, particular webinar, uh, we offer it in uh, conjunction with the Capital Region uh, HR uh, Association. Now, CRHRA is recognised by SHRM to offer professional development credits uh, for the various SHRM certifications. Uh, the programme is also eligible for HRCI credit as well. So if you have registered, which you have because you're here, um, we will actually send you uh, out the, um, the, the relevant certificates for your, for your PDC afterwards. Uh, if you don't receive it, please uh, send me an email, wtrev.albanylaw.edu, and I will make sure that you get one. Next slide, please. Uh, now, if you'd like to know more about the uh, Capital uh, Region HR Association, there are opportunities for networking. They have uh, a regular newsletter uh, and uh, they uh, also have uh, various complimentary networking uh, sessions. So if you contact uh, info at crhra.org, somebody will be waiting there to uh, respond to you. If you are a human resources professional, in the capital region, then it is certainly worth your while getting involved with them. Uh, and uh, in 2021, they are um, uh, celebrating 70, 75 years of, uh, of existence. Next slide, please. Uh, now, the uh, online graduate programs here at Albany Law School, we have just launched an uh, HR program uh, specifically for HR professionals perhaps looking to take that next step up in your career. Um, we're offering a nine credit certificate, a 30 credit master's, and if you have a JD, there's even a 24 credit at LLM. Um, the latter can be completed in as little as 12 months. The program has de been designed specifically for working HR professionals. Uh, it is industry focused and it is aligned with the, the SHRM, the Society of Human Resources Management Principles. Uh, it's a flexible program uh, and as it is 100% online and uh, asynchronous, it's designed to fit in with your, your career needs. Uh, it's, uh, it's taught by HR industry professionals as well. And uh, if you want to know more about it, please give us a call on 518-443-5260, 518 or send us an email to graduateadmissions at albanylaw.edu. Next slide, please. Um, there is a, an application deadline coming up, and that is May the 17th, that is this, uh, this coming Monday. So uh, if you are interested in, in studying for the, the summer one term, uh, it'll be a, a tight turnaround, but, uh, uh, but get, get, get in contact with us. We, we may be able to get you started later in, uh, in the year instead. We have six starts a year, summer, summer one and two, uh, fall one and two, and uh, um, uh, and spring one and two as well. But please get in touch, 518-443-5260. Next slide, please. Uh, and uh, our next webinar, this one is not part of the HR in practice series, which, which this one is. This is, this is one uh, related to our cybersecurity program. Uh, it's gonna be next Wednesday, May the 19th 
um, get this one in your calendar. Uh, time will be one o'clock to two o'clock uh, Eastern Standard Time. Uh, we have the, the, the local guys from the FBI team. Uh, they're going to be coming and talking about cybersecurity in the FBI, uh, an expert panel discussion with Albany FBI. They're going to talk about some of the trends taking place in, uh, in cybersecurity. They're, they're also going to talk more about exactly what the role of the FBI, FBI is in terms of cybersecurity. That's, that's, uh, that's going to be unmissable. So uh, please don't uh, forget to register and come along and, uh, and see that one as well. Next slide, please. So without further ado, let me introduce uh, our, uh, our speaker today. Uh, he's Zachary Jones, and he is the VP of uh, Labor Relations at uh, United uh, Airlines. Uh, in this role, he's uh, responsible for the development and implementation of the labor strategy, the negotiation and administration of all the labor agreements governing uh, United's uh, represented employees, including the coordination of international bargaining. Uh, he's more than 30 years of experience in leading labor organizations. And prior to joining United, he served as a vice president of labor relations at CX, CSX. And now in that role, he led labor strategy and was chief labor spokesperson for the company in a, a multi-employer, multi-union collective bargain, bargaining negotiation uh, covering 13 unions and approximately 150,000 employees nationally, as well as serving as a trustee of a 2.5 billion healthcare fund. Uh, I am very delighted uh, to welcome today uh, Mr. Zachary Jones. Welcome to you. Uh, thank you, Dean. Uh, and uh, welcome, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, I, I, I think next week program is sounds really exciting. I, I'm located in uh, St. Augustine, Florida now, and uh, the, the Southeast is really getting hit hard with what happened with, I believe, Colonial Pipeline, the pipeline with the cybersecurity uh, uh, breach. So what, what, what timely information. Uh, I, I don't know how many are located in Albany, New York. Uh, I call Washington DC home. Uh, I have been to Albany one time in uh, February of 1993. And uh, I actually was an attorney practicing at a firm and I was head of our sports representation practice. And I was meeting with a young man from Albany who was an All-American out of Boston College, a running back, Chucky Dutes. And um, had uh, that's the only time I've been to Albany, but I was just looking at the campus and it looks very beautiful. So I have some, hopefully some exciting information, some informative uh, stuff planned for you. And at the end, I'm gonna ask for your help. So we'll, we'll, we'll try to get through this crisply. So, the agenda will be an overview of the Railway Labor Act and how it's different from the National Labor Relations Act. Uh, I'll talk about the role of the National Mediation Board, which is an independent government agency located in Washington, D.C. that handles uh, labor relations in the airline and railroad industry. And I uh, will switch over to United Airlines specifically. And one of the reasons when I left CSX in uh, 2018, why I decided to join United was this uh, what I consider a unique collaborative approach with the unions. Uh, United is about 85 to 90 percent unionized. Um, so uh, we have a lot of unions and it's very important to uh, have good collaborative partnerships um, to achieve the enterprise's uh, objectives and goals. And then I'll talk to you about interest-based problem solving approach that we use at United in an effort to try to get through some of the tough issues and then open, I'll have an exercise in there and then we'll try to get to some questions. So a lot of information over the next uh, 55 minutes. So let's talk about, uh, next slide, let's talk about the overview of, uh, let's talk about the overview of the Railway Labor Act first. Uh, the Railway Labor Act was formed in 1926. So if the math is correct, it's about a 91 year law. And uh, one of the reasons it has had such long st uh, staying, staying power is that it was really drafted by unions and companies. And it was designed, if you look back into the early 1900s, the labor strikes back then was really violent. And so to avoid companies knew that they could not continue to go forward having strikes like that, that had so much violence involved on their property. So they drafted a law uh, that is really 
uh, has worked. And because of the import of interstate commerce, uh, the Railway Labor Act is really a, a long drawn out process when you get into negotiations. So uh, a comment, negotiations would have direct negotiations for maybe a year to two years, and then you have to have mediation. So if you're under the National Labor Relations Act, you may have invited mediators from FMCS, Federal Mediation Conciliation Service. Well, under the Railway Labor Act, mediation is compulsory. So you have to invite the mediator and the mediation board into your negotiations to try to help you to an amicable agreement without work stoppage. And sometimes that could take another two, three years. So now you're five years into your negotiations. Uh, you say, well, what happens with the work stoppage? The company locking out unions or unions going on strike. Well, under the Railway Labor Act, union, uh, contracts do not expire. They become amendable. And so what you mean by that is when your expiration date comes up, the next day is business as usual, and you will continue to operate under the status quo until a new agreement is reached. And so you'll go through the mediation process, and at some point, uh, hopefully you'll reach an amicable agreement without any type of work stoppage, but if the mediation board feels that it's time to advance the negotiations, they would have the power to release the parties. And the railroad industry, whenever the, mediate, the mediation board released the railroads, uh, we, there would be a presidential, what is known as a presidential emergency board, where the president of the United States would appoint three to five um, arbitrators to listen to the arguments of the unions and the company and try to make a recommendation as far as how to resolve the dispute. And then if that doesn't work, uh, normally, uh, you can have an opportunity for Congress to step in and just impose the, impose whatever was the presidential uh, emergency board recommendation. Rarely will Congress step in and the parties will find some type of resolution. And the reason it's drawn out under the Railway Labor Act versus the National Labor Relations Act is the, the, the primary the principal focus of the railway labor act is to avoid interruption to interstate commerce so imagine if the railroads went on strike then goods and products uh getting to albany or washington dc georgia florida texas would just be clogged up throughout our country and so i think that uh, the, the the company and union when they drafted the law uh wanted to avoid that going forward or think of a, a situation in, in the airline industry where you would have a legacy carrier like a Delta, uh, an American, a United, who would just stop flying. How much uh, service would that pull out of the marketplace? And what would that do to interstate commerce, uh, moving people or freight? And so I have been in a case one time with Amtrak. I was a mediator before I went into corporate America, I practiced law. And then I worked a decade at the National Mediation Board as a mediator, and then I went into corporate America. And I, I, my first week on the job, I went to a mediation with Amtrak electrical workers. And so seven years, no, in 19, that was in year 2000. And so in 2007, um, President Bush, asked, why is it taking so long to resolve the Amtrak dispute? So um, the mediator had to go over to the White House and try to explain what the, the challenges were. So they asked me to substitute for them in the mediation. So I went in, I said, well, why don't each side update me and tell me where you are and then I can try to help guide the discussions. And one of the leaders from the union told me, uh, uh, our negotiations is like a good soap opera. Uh, we're in the same spot we were when you left us seven years ago. So uh, it, it's designed for the wheels of justice to turn slowly, again, to avoid the interruption of interstate commerce. So uh, let's talk about United Airlines. Um, you know, one of the things I told you when I was transitioning from the railroad, I was looking at several companies uh, to see where would I land. And one of the things that I really liked about United Airlines is that it's, it's 
definitive effort. You know, they, it's almost like it's an affirmative obligation of the Labor Relations Department to communicate with union leaders. And so because of that, it creates this partnership, it creates this dialogue that helps, helps us get across the bridges that where we're apart. And, you know, by definition, labor relations, you are going to have conflicts. And uh, I have a theory that you can agree to disagree without being disagreeable. So we are disagreeing. Let's sit down and talk about how to resolve this in a way that will be beneficial for the enterprise and hopefully also beneficial for the unions. And uh, I think that we're very successful at doing that. And uh, we bring our unions along with major enterprise type decisions and uh, it, 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 it creates a good working relationship. But uh, you may one day read in the paper and say, hey, United is having a lot of problems with these unions. And it, it, but again, by definition, that could happen because they're seeking A and we may only want to give up B. So let's talk about the interest-based approach to bargaining. Now, in a proposal-based approach, normally, which is common a lot in negotiating, it's you give a proposal, I give a proposal to counter, you give a proposal, I give a proposal, and then you kind of settle somewhere in the middle. And, and a lot of times leverage will dictate where that settlement is. So, uh, and, but in a facilitated problem solving process, you can explore various interests to try to, and it's interest driven to try to reach a resolution. And the parties will do that together. Now in a proposal based approach, normally uh, the company is in this caucus room and the union is in this caucus room. They'll come together into a common room and a proposal will be passed and one side or the other will walk the other side through the proposal and all of the elements of the contract that they want to try to achieve. And a facilitated problem solving approach, you normally try to identify what is the problem statement, right? What is the problem statement? And then you try to get around uh, uh, you, you the union and company will sit at the table together and jointly approach solving that problem. So next slide. Okay, he, he, here's an example of the traditional model I was talking about. Normally the parties, the company and union will stay apart from each other the entire time. So the union will be in this caucus, the company will be in this caucus, they meet to discuss, a person will make an offer and explain the offer. You go back to your caucus rooms, you review it, you analyze it, you mark up the offer. What do you think we can accept? What do you think we may be able to live with, but not now? And we want to hold that in our back pocket and accept it further down the road as a strategic move. And what can we say yes to now, if anything? Then you go back into the meeting room again, and then you pass your counter proposal. And that continues on and on and on until you meet. So using a sports analogy, suppose uh, you start out sometimes when I was a mediator, I would say, well, the company is in Buffalo Stadium and the union is in um, San Francisco Stadium. So we're so far apart. We have a lot of wood to chop here if we're going to get to an agreement. And the goal is to meet in Kansas City or at Arrowhead Stadium or meet at Bears Stadium. And then we're in the parking lot. Let's get on the field and start setting up our goalposts and trying to figure out where on that field, there's what I call the zone of reasonableness, where are we going to settle this negotiations? So that's the traditional model. Next slide. So in an interest-based approach, it's almost done simultaneously running together. So you have a company and union, they will come together and many times you'll sit around the table and it's a, it, it really relies on open, candid communications. So sometimes you might see company, union, company, union, company, union, and people are just mixed in versus all the companies sitting on the east side of the room, all of the union negotiators sitting on the west side of the room. And so what you're trying to do is establish the, what is the issue? Identify the issue. What is the problem statement? And then you work together to identify the problem statement. And then 
you say, that is the what, what is the problem? And then next you start talking about what are the interests? Why is it important to resolve this problem? And then you talk about your interests. It could be flexibility, it could be, you know, companies. If you ever play bingo, unions will joke that the company, the uh, profit or money is the free space on the bingo card for the company. So many times when you get into the room, the union will say, well, money, make me money as almost a joke or a dig at the company because we know that's what, what you're concerned with. And then, so you come up with a list of interests and then you go through the interests to say, well, what interests are common? What is, what's common to each side that we can reach a conclusion? And then some issues might be just unique to the company or unique to the union. But when I see participants who are really good at this process, many times they are reaching out, trying to meet the interests of the other side. Because to the extent I can meet your interests and to the extent you can meet mine, the higher probability of us reaching an agreement. So next, after you have your issue identified and then you go to your interests, you start talking about options. And remember the issue is the what, the interests are the why, why is important to solve it. The list of options are the, uh, the how, how do you solve it, potential. And there's some, there's some protocol and ground rules when it comes to uh, listing options. You want to be as creative as you possibly can be. And as people are placing options on the table, there's no such thing as a bad option. It might be an option you cannot agree with, that's fine. When you come out of your caucus, then you just say, you know, you just don't circle it, but don't criticize a person putting up an option, don't cross through it. It's just, you cannot, I will not circle that as an option I'm willing to explore further. So for example, uh, I was uh, uh, teaching a course one time and we were talking about interest base and we're going through. So I went to the group and said in the class, uh, name a bird. So people started going around the room, ego, cardinal, robin, right? And so and today, no one wants to be embarrassed to get to them and say, oh, I can't name a bird. So people start flipping to their cell phones to come up with birds that weren't named. So one young lady had left her cell phone up in her room and guess where she was from? She was from Boston. So as everyone looked at her, there was this uncomfortable silence. So she looked and said, Larry Bird. And everyone started laughing. I said, whoa, time out. Larry Bird counts, that's a bird. So then the next person said, Lady Bird Johnson. And then we had someone from Minnesota who loved Prince and start talking about the dance, the bird. And so it became somewhat of a comical exercise, but the point was proven. I never placed them in a box when I said name a bird. The first seven or eight people who named Robin, Ego, Cardinal, they started forming the box. But when you're thinking creatively on how to solve a problem, any solution is a good solution because you never know where it may take you and you talk about it. And some at the end, I was, I was proffered a solution yesterday and I'm thinking in my head, oh boy, I know my CEO and my boss, my executive vice president is going to reject this. But when the person started talking about it, I said, okay, hey, look, there's no such thing as a bad solution. We will consider it. Now I may have to come back to you and say no, but we will consider it. And so that's what you're trying to do in an interest-based approach. Uh, next slide. So again, the what is the topic, the issue, the interest, why, what is the desire behind resolving this? And then the options are how, and you wanna be as creative as possible. Next. Okay, so again, you go through it, you try to check, you pressure test it, because you want to know that you're solving the right issue. Nothing is more frustrating than to go through the exercise and then when you get to the end and you start talking say, well, none of these solutions solve my problem. And then you have to go back and say, okay, well, what is your problem? And then you dig a little deeper. Think of peeling back the layers of an onion. 
and you're just digging deeper and deeper and deeper. And my son is coming to visit me uh, tomorrow, uh, bringing his family here, and I'm going to see my grandson. And I always tell him, I said, God, you were one of the best interest-based negotiators I knew growing up as a kid. And he said, why? And I said, because you always said, why? 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 And when you ask the question why, really what you're doing is peeling back the layers. Why is this important? Why is this a problem that needs to be solved? Are we solving the problem at hand or we're solving other issues and it's not going to solve this problem? So make sure that you agree on the problem you're trying to solve and then you go to the next step, which is the interest. And then you start trying to define the interest. What are the silent motivators? What are silent motivators that drives this? I, I, we recently sold a home here and moved into a new one in St. Augustine and the couple was from New York. And as you're trying to settle the agreement, it became clear that what they really loved about the house was the backyard, the patio, pool patio, the furnishing, everything there, outdoor kitchen. And so as we're negotiating, it became clear that this was a, this was a problem for them because they loved this backyard and they wanted to keep it. Well, guess what? My wife didn't like it because she said it didn't match the new house we were going to. So it's really sleeves off our vest. We were going to junk it or give it to Goodwill, et cetera. So in understanding the problem that they were trying to get through and finalizing the deal and understanding what was motivating them, I said, well, how about we throw in the entire backyard as part of the deal? And wow, did that solve the problem? But it was just absolutely, what is wrong? What is driving? What do you like about why, why, why? We were able to get to a meaningful solution in closing the deal. Uh, that has happened to me in buying a car. You know, why, why, why? Why is it important for me to do the deal the way you want to do it? And then when you start peeling back the layers, you completely understand. And then of course, the options is be creative. You know, think outside the box. Don't, you know, cause many times, and sometimes I'm guilty of that. And, and I know when I used to try cases as a lawyer, you know, you're not applying effective listening skills. What you're doing is thinking, I totally disagree with what you're saying. So I'm trying to think of my rebuttal as you talk. So I'm missing out on 50% of what you're saying. And really what I should be doing is active listening and asking you questions so I can get a better understanding of where you are and why you are there and how we are able, how we would be able to resolve this dispute. Next slide. So once you, you know, the best behaviors and problem solving, ask open-ended questions, you know? Why is this a problem? You know, you know, you you say flexibility is important to you. Give me an example of flexibility. What do you mean by having flexibility? You know, for, for, for me, I need dependability. How does dependability and flexibility in your mind clash? Or are there any clashes? What happens, you know, and then you ask, and then you take, don't take notes, just listen. Because sometimes when we're taking notes, we're not as listening. And this requires the sharing of information in the process. You have to be willing to share information. And a lot of times when we're doing interest-based bargaining at United Airlines, it's, it's, it's a really a safe space. And you say, hey, look, we're, trying, we're talking. It's almost, it's your restaurant voice talking out loud. It's your stream of consciousness sometimes coming out. And if you're in a traditional negotiations um, um, type of process, many people will say a card laid is a card played. And if you try to pick up that card, then you're doing regressive bargaining. If you're doing regressive bargaining, you're dealing in bad faith and I'm not going to work with anyone who deals in bad faith. But in an interest-based approach, it's 
you're trying to spark conversation and which may lead to additional information. So confidentiality is of the utmost importance because the unions will probably share some confidential information with the company and the company will share confidential information with the union. And the worst thing either side could do is breach that confidentiality. Because once the trust goes, I can't work with you. I'm gonna have a difficult time working with you. So you focus on the issue and the interest and take the personalities out. You know, sometimes people have rough discussions and because of that rough discussion, I don't wanna deal with you anymore. I don't wanna talk to you, you know, uh, but we have to get by the people and focus on be hard on the problem solving, be hard on the problem and the issue and not hard on people. And many times I will try to set the stage for many of our union leaders. I will say, look, feel free to say whatever you want to to me. And if you think it's going to be salty, if you think it might border on getting out of bounds, let's us just have a private conversation. Let's not do that in public. And then speak your mind and I will try to respond. We can always put Humpty Dumpty back together again. As long as we trust each other and have respect. And if you feel that you're about to cross the line because you're so um, bought in to the solution or the problem or something the company did, let's have that discussion. And Guess what? Sometimes I may say, you know, I never looked at it that right. You're absolutely right. I'm going to call up our ops leader and I'm going to have a talk to the ops leader. And we're going to try to correct that. We're going to try to self-correct. I'm gonna, Here's what I'm going to do. And if I can deliver, I'll let you know I can deliver. If I cannot deliver, I'll let you know I cannot deliver. And, and guess what? There's always a pathway to a resolution. You know, if for those who practice law, many times when your settlement discussions will fail, you know, the pathway to a resolution is to try the case. And, and negotiations, if, it, if it's a grievance, go to an arbitrator. If it's some type of major dispute under the Railway Labor Act, I'll see you in federal court. There's always a pathway to a solution. And so you have to get past uh, personalities and what happened, but sometimes that's hard. You know, people will come to me and say, oh, in 1985, and I start saying, wow, in 1985, I was in Minneapolis, Minnesota, probably in uh, 20 below zero, right, with two feet of snow. So next slide. So here are some of the behaviors that uh, will cause this process to uh, fail. You got parties taking rigid positions, my way or the highway, uh, parties who don't participate. So you have just the chief, chief spokespersons going back and forth in every, as you would in a traditional setting. And then the other participants just sitting at the table, um, trying to control the process by not having candid discussion across the table, keep calling caucuses. Uh, if someone brings up a solution saying, oh, that's a dumb idea or that's a dumb interest, I disagree with it totally, because now people are gonna start shutting down because if that's how you're going to respond to me, then we have to resolve this dispute in a different way. Next, next slide. Oh, okay, so now we're, now we're at the end and uh, that went very well. We're at uh, 135, so we're gonna open up for questions at about quarter of, so I have 10 minutes. So this worked out perfect. So here is the question to the team on the phone or on this webinar. Uh, we've been in a pandemic for a little over a year. Uh, at United, my team has been out of the office uh, since March of 2020. And we're beginning to discuss return to work. Now, prior to the pandemic, I probably didn't apply anything I just told you about flexible work schedule, hybrid work, whatever the case might be. I was, I'm old school. Feet has to be where the work is. The work is at 233 South Wacker Drive, Chicago, Illinois, 60606, 25th floor. No, you cannot live anywhere else. 
No, you cannot telecommute. That's what it is. What I have found over the last year is that my labor team has been ultra productive, ultra efficient. And what I try to do to stay in contact with them is I have a wellness check once per month. And uh, it's for 30 minutes and we don't talk business. We talk about family. We talk about what are you doing to stay, stay fit mentally, physically. Uh, and over the course of these discussions, I started understanding better how people were commuting 90 minutes one way on a train. Chicago is an enormous city. So most of my team lives around Chicago in the suburbs. So I said, wow, that's a lot of productivity loss because during this pandemic, it was nothing for people to be on the phone at 6.30, 7 o'clock. And many were saying, well, I would be on the train anyway, but now instead of being on the train, I'm working. And then they would work to seven to a point that I had to establish a virtual office. People were working so hard. And the virtual office is uh, if you need to talk to someone before 7.30, ask yourself the question, can it wait? And then call them at 7.30 or after. If you need to talk to someone after 6 p.m., ask the question, can it wait until tomorrow? And if not, then you make the call. Same applies for weekends. Because I mean, we were working seven days a week, 15, 16, 17 hours a day, easily. So here's the question to the group. And I'll frame it up as a problem statement. I know people are asking questions. Maybe you can talk about what are the interests and then we'll talk about what are some of the potential solutions. And then I'll tell you where I landed. Uh, so what policy, if any, should I implement for return to work on or about July 1st of 2021? What policy for the labor relations team should I implement for return to work on or about July 1st, 2021? So what do you think some of the interests are going to be? And then you can read off some of those if whoever's getting the questions. So Zachary, we'll, we'll just turn on the chat because uh, we normally okay, have it turned that would be perfect. So, okay, so that well, while we let people respond to that, so Zachary wants to know what policy he should be implementing in terms of the, the return to work. Um, in, in the meantime, Zachary, I've, I've got a few questions for you. Oh, um, sure. You, you mentioned that some of these negotiations, particularly you, you mentioned recently, you've just entered into negotiation with the United Pilots. The, yeah. these, these negotiations can take a very long time, five years, seven years. Um, why, why does it take so long? And does the perhaps the, the original intention uh, or perhaps the original grievance or the original positions, do, do they shift significantly during that time? I mean, personnel change, uh, living standards change. Why, why does it take so long? Uh, be, normally because the, you're, you're talking, you're recreating a collective bargaining agreement. So you will start the pilot agreements, I believe is about 500 plus pages. And so you'll start on page one and you'll go through the entire agreement. Some, some terms will remain the same and some will change because over the period of years as you have operated under the agreement, the company might see ways that they could operate, that it could operate more efficiently and the union might see some things that they feel they want more protection around. And so those are the things that, uh, and, and, it's, and it's just the natural form of the negotiations. And, and, and many of my friends will, they, they are just boggled that it will take two, three, four, five years in order to reach an agreement. But it, that's what happens normally. And, and so once that round of negotiations is completed and, and, a, and an, an agreed document is then in place, um, it, it, it must be fairly soon that perhaps another round of negotiations yeah. opens. <laughs> Yeah, sometimes that happens. Well, in the railroad industry, I used to joke because it would literally take four years. So you go year one to four, it's retroactive to year one. So you take about a six month break and then you start preparing for the next round of bargaining. 
and then you do this, then you wash, rinse, and repeat. And the airline industry, sometimes that happens also. And so by the time you get to an agreement, and if it's five years and you take four, then you're almost back up talking again for the next round. So Zachary, we, we, some of your team of negotiators are now presenting some possible um, resolutions for you. Um, Claire Parham has suggested uh, working remotely for those who have a long commute and actually can work more efficiently from home, uh, they would need to come in once a week for team, team meetings. Huh. Uh, I saw a hybrid. I saw a hybrid work. Yeah, Francisco, uh, uh, Francisco uh, Pineda Suarez says voluntary offer hybrid options. Yep. And uh, Gary Stroud down there in Texas, Gary's saying, uh, make sure you have a solid performance management policy before going back to the office. Uh, if you do not go back, uh, like in the old days, it's imperative that you have a performance management policy in place that everyone understands. Sounds like a CHRO. <laughs> Okay, good, good ideas. And, and so just to tell you what I ended up doing, I brought the team together. After I, I talked to each individual, and I brought the team together. And, and these are the ideas we came up with. Uh, there's, there's going to be a couple of people who will work remotely 100% um, of the time. Uh, there's a group of people who will be on a hybrid where they're coming into the office a couple of days per month. And then um, because they mo they work mostly with the field. So I kind of looked at the job and the job description and they say, why do you have to be in the office? What is important about you being in the office? Now, there is some connectivity when someone brought up the team building. I think that's very important. So I will have. I have town halls once per month and everybody will come together. So that's part of the team building and staying connected. And then I have a leadership team and my leadership team will be in the office more often. My leadership team will be in the office three days, four days per week. And the reason because of that is the leadership team, you know, right now we will have all of our union contracts up for negotiations. So we will be reporting out to our executive team, the status of the negotiations, reporting out to our CEO, the status of the negotiations. So I think it's more important for our leadership team to be in the office more often. And then our managers and senior managers who really work with the hubs out in the field. We have hubs in San Francisco, Los Angeles, uh, Denver, Houston, Chicago, Dulles outside of Washington, D.C., and New, uh, Newark, New Jersey, they work with our field operations. So it's okay for them to spend most of their time either traveling around our network or communicating via Teams and phones. I know you use Zoom and we use uh, Microsoft Teams. So that, that, that's pretty much the makeup. Of course, it's fluid. And so to the gentleman from Texas, when we talk about um, uh, solid performance. I, I, I tell my team, uh, I have uh, two rules. One is do your job. Okay. Well, one is show up for work first, wherever you are, show up. And the second one is do your job. And, and then implicit in doing your job is that you're going to do it at a very high level. So Zachary, thank you for that. In, in terms of um, how the pandemic has impacted the way negotiations take place, um, how, how, how has that brought in changes in terms of negotiations between employers and, and unions? And do you see any of these changes perhaps continuing on long after the pandemic? Well, hopefully long after the pandemic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hopefully long after the pandemic. <laughs> Uh, one thing it has done is we had to get a couple of letter of agreements and memorandums of understanding. And uh, early in the pandemic, there's no way you could come together. Normally, uh, we rotate around the network. So we can meet in Los Angeles, San Francisco, Denver, uh, Dallas, uh, Newark, and negotiate with the various unions. Uh, because of the pandemic, uh, we switched to Microsoft Teams. 
So it's nothing, to, just like we're having a conversation and webinar now, you would have uh, the union representatives would be on teams and the company representatives would be on teams. And a lot of it still using the interest-based approach. We would try to problem solve whatever we were trying to, uh, whatever the problem was. Uh, I believe that once the pandemic is over, it's going to depend. I think it will be a hybrid that uh, many people will get back into the room. A lot of folks would say, what, what you really miss is um, being out in the courtyard, uh, getting a break, and then the union leader is out in the courtyard getting a break, and then all of a sudden there's a whisper. Maybe you guys should think about ABC. It may go over a little easier. Maybe you should think about XYZ. And the same way from the company, it's, it's more difficult to do that. But what you find is sometimes you have those conversations just by picking up Teams or Zoom and calling someone or setting up a, uh, on a, a phone call and say, hey, I want to give you some feedback on what we're talking about or I want to give you this offline and it's confidential if you don't want it confidential just you know hey you can bring it up in full session if you like uh from a one thing that really helped us uh from a grievance and arbitration standpoint a lot of the arbitrators have fell in love without with not having to travel so they say hey i could you can just send me the briefs i can read the briefs and i can listen to the arguments on zoom or microsoft team and i can make a decision so a lot of our arbitrators are saying, hey, let's keep it going. So I think what will stay is there will be some cases where credibility of the witness, lawyers who try the cases will talk about, you know, credibility of the witness and really being able to look at that person as you cross-examine that individual or examine them to, to make sure he or she is truthful. And, Arbitrators will need to be present and the attorneys will need to be present to do that. Other cases, you're gonna be able to do it right on Teams. So I think it's going to be a combination uh, as we go forward, some in person, some in Teams. I also think that uh, I'm an introvert by definition in nature. And when my boss wanted our leadership team, the vice presidents who report up to her to meet in person, my colleagues are saying, oh, it's so great, I wanna meet. I'm like, shoot, I can go the next 10 years and I'm fine. <laughs> you know, I just talk to you via Teams. But when we met in Chicago, I was actually surprised and amazed at what impact it had on me to be in the room with my colleagues and to you know, do a fist bump or elbow bump and to be there and eyeball them and know that they're okay and to have that discussion it was really energizing. And that's something I tell my team. I say, I know you don't wanna get on a train for 90 minutes. And I know, but let's not underestimate what being in the presence of others will do to your engagement and your longevity, your you know, mental stability, health, all of that that comes into play. So, um, I, that's what I think is going on, you know, at United and with my team. And so we will get together. Uh, but I do think that um, my old school philosophy of your feet got to be where the work is has really, this pandemic has changed. It. Zachary, and, and I'm not worried about performance. Zachary, in terms of negotiation skills, um, when you go into a new negotiation, to what extent are you forewarned by what your opponent's possible position might be? To, to, how, to what extent is that beneficial? And to what extent do you perhaps go in and say, okay, we'll have a clean sheet so that we can sort of uh, have uh, good faith in terms of these negotiations? And, and one further part to that, when we were talking beforehand, you, you mentioned something called a BATNA. Can you talk us through um, what, what a BATNA is? As well? Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, 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 you'll hear me say that. I don't care what you're negotiating for. Know your BATNA, right? And that's B-A-T-N-A. -A. And that's your best alternative to no agreement. And sometimes your BATNA is just to walk away. You know, to just to say no. If you're trying to negotiate for a car, and the dealership is not giving you 
the additives that you want on the car, it's not giving you the price or the financing that you want. It's okay to go get in your car and say, thank you, no thank you. That's your BATNA, to walk away and you are perfectly fine without having a car. Like for example, uh, last, I guess, September, my son was hit, the car ran a red light, totaled his car. And so he was really upset and was saying, okay, I gotta go buy a car. And I said, whoa, 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 don't do anything. I'm driving you my car because the last thing you want to do is catch a cab to a car dealership. One, you have lost all leverage whatsoever and they know you don't have a BATNA because you're not going to walk home and you're gonna either have to call another cab home. I said, no, you, you drive this car there and then you sit down and try to negotiate. And if you don't get the deal you want, you walk out, get in the car and drive away. And so he did that for a while. And then he finally reached an agreement that he wanted on the car he wanted. But sometimes your BATNA goes to what type of leverage you want. You know, if a job offer, right? If you have a job and you have a job that you really like and an executive recruiter comes calling you or if another company calls you and say, hey, I want to offer you a job, et cetera then the leverage is on your side because you love your job right now. What they have to do is come in and make this opportunity so enticing that you're willing to take the next step, which is possibly leave your current situation, right? So, but if you're out of work, then you're, you don't have that leverage. And if you have several, you know, opportunities, then that's one thing that you're talking to. You're talking to three or four different companies simultaneously. But if you only have one, then to say no takes a different level of intestitude, right? Because if you have a mortgage, you have car note, student loans, whatever the case might be, you might say, I don't know when the next opportunity like this will come along. And so your BATNA is your best alternative to no agreement and always know what your BATNA is when you go into a, to any negotiations. Now, as far as what I try to do with my team is set the table, I have a matrix and the matrix is your must-haves. What are the four or five must-have items that you we want to walk away with in four or five years? And then you have your would like to haves and the would like to have, oh, I want this, I want that, you know, and then your pie in the sky. And then what of those must-haves are strategic to the enterprise and what are transactional, operational, day-to-day -to, -day to the enterprise? So that's your matrix. And looking at that matrix, you can get a good feel for how these negotiations are going. And and, and you're driving your must-haves because your must-haves are more than likely going to be strategic and it's going to impact the enterprise for years to come and probably for decades to come. And if it's just the individual transaction, it, it's the same thing. What, what are your must-haves? And, and like I told you about the house transaction, apparently their must-haves was to capture the backyard. They didn't want to have to do anything, shopping, anything for the backyard. They just wanted to capture it. That's ours. That was a must have. But for us, it was sleeves off our best. We, you know, we weren't, we weren't, we we're going to junk it anyway. So the fact that we were able to get, meet their must haves helped the deal go smoothly. All right, Zachary, we've got five minutes left. There, there's one question that um, prompted itself from our discussions before today. Uh, you were uh, an NFL contract negotiator before you uh, joined, right. became a labor negotiator. That's a very tough environment. What, what are the, the, the sort of tips and, and tricks to negotiation that you picked up and perhaps some of your, perhaps some of your, your war stories as well? Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I'll tell you two. And um, uh, it goes to, well, three, I'll tell you three. It, 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 it goes to leverage and being prepared. So the first one was probably taught to me by Al Davis from the Raiders. And I was negotiating and restructuring with him. And during that time, Al was negotiating with local communities to build a new stadium for the Raiders. And in the 
terms of the agreement, it was like, okay, you have to uh, uh, reach the financing by a date certain. If you don't, then the money goes hard to him. And then he had done a couple of deals with some people who walked into the room and was like, oh, Al Davis, Hall of Famer, you know, let me get your autograph. And so he, can, he told me, he said, look, people say I'm a bad guy. I'm not. He said, in life, I believe you do unto people as you want them to do unto you. I said, yeah, that's a, that's a good philosophy. I like that one. He said, but in business, you do unto people as they allow you to do them. And what I took from that comment is that when you go into a room with him, he wants you to be prepared. He wants you to be prepared to handle your business. And so whenever I go into a negotiation, I try to do as much research as possible, try to understand as much of the material as possible so I can be prepared. Um, the second one would have to be Bobby Beathard, who used to be the general manager of the Washington football team. See, I'm from Washington, DC, the Washington football team. And, um, then he went out to the San Diego Chargers and he was in the negotiations and he's told his agent, look, your player needs to show up by Sunday. If he's not here Sunday, starting Monday, I'm deducting 50,000 off his contract until he shows up. So Monday comes, he says, okay, you were making, you know, the offer was 5 million, now it's 5,950. Okay, it's 500, 900, you know, 4,900. Okay, it's four. And so by the time the end of the week came, they show up. They say, okay, I want my five million. So no, 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 it, you know, you've been out for uh, five days. So I'm gonna deduct a quarter of a million. And it became a big issue, but you deducted that quarter of a million. And what I took from that is don't block, don't block. You know, if, if you're gonna say something, make sure, and that goes to your BATNA also, don't say you're gonna walk away and not be willing to walk away. Uh, if you're gonna walk away, then be prepared to walk away. And so that came, don't bluff. And then the final one probably was with uh, John Isaac, who was the general manager of Tampa Bay Buccaneers. And it was like, do your homework again, right? And it was, I was trying to sign a player. It was complex, but I had to have it signed by a certain date. And John kept, pushing it down the road, pushing it down the road, saying, I'll take care of you, don't worry about it. I said, no, we need to either have a new deal or sign this by a certain date. No, 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 I'll take care of you, I'll take care of you. So I told my player, sign this, pre-sign the contract. If we have not finalized a new one by 12 noon, I'm gonna fax it. So I'm dating myself telling you I'm gonna fax it, right? So never heard from John, never heard from John. I call his office the morning of on a Friday and his executive assistant says, well, he's not here. I said, well, where is he? I need to talk to him. She said, I have no idea where he is. I said, okay, 12 o'clock came, I faxed the contract at 12.05, my phone rings. Well, why did you do that? I said, I couldn't contact you. Well, you don't trust me? I said, no, I trust you, but I trust and verify. So as it turns out, another player in the same situation did not sign his contract. And there's a technicality in the collective bargaining agreement that says, if you don't sign your restrictive free agent contract by this date certain that the, the um, team could reduce your salary by almost a third. So now they reduced the salary and he was negotiating a new contract off of a lower base. Where my player, since we sign at the higher salary, we were negotiating our salary off a higher base, and he ended up getting a pretty good, pretty good uh, deal. So do your homework <laughs> and positive listening. You know, skills. Make sure you have active listening skills. As open-ended questions. Uh, know your BATNA. Come prepared. These are all the things that you know I picked up personally in negotiations and and in business and, and be patient, be patient. Sometimes a deal, the deal that is for you takes time. Be patient. Zachary, we've reached two o'clock. Thank you so much. That was that was a masterclass. Not, not only will we now be able to negotiate with a union over seven years, we'll be able to negotiate a better deal on our car 
and uh, and, a, and a better deal on our hands as well. That's right. So, That's Zachary, right. thank you so much. Thanks for coming and and giving us your 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 uh, your lifetime of uh, experience. It really is appreciated. And, um, and thank you. I really appreciate it. Enjoyed it, folks. Thanks for coming as well. Uh, don't forget our next. Uh, event is next week, the 19th. We've got Albany FBI coming to talk about uh, cyber security. So uh, please do join us and please do fill out the uh, the survey um, that you'll see on your screen when you, when you log out. But folks, thanks very much for coming today. Please enjoy your day.